we talk about socialization all the time, but we always equate it to an act of introducing that puppy to other dogs or other people or bringing them into the hardware store with us and, and new environments and stuff. But you don't think about, uh, just the, the, the main house life situation they're raised in influencing, you know, how, how socialized they are or, or well, how they might work together with you anyway. You know, I'll be honest with you, I haven't seen all of your podcasts, Tony, but I know one of the things that we tell people is buying two puppies from the same litter and trying to raise them is a huge mistake. I have tried it twice and I failed miserably and I know exactly what I'm doing. I know what I should be doing. But I mean, let's face it, when I get up at three in the morning, the last thing I want to do is take one out and potty him and spend 15 minutes with him, put him up, get the other one out and then do the same thing. I just get tired and I get them both out and hey, I come home from work. I'm tired. I just put the two of them together. And before I know it, they've bonded with each other and they don't want to spend any time with me. So, you know, I always I always try to tell people that if you can spend 80 percent of your day of, of that dog's life or his day with you, 80 percent and 20 percent he can spend with another dog or whatever. That's fine. But 80 percent of his day needs to be with you or by himself. Mm hmm. How do you so how do you reconcile that then being somebody who takes in puppies and trains them knowing, you know, you're the one that's training them? Are you are you bringing the clients in to work with the dogs with you as well? Or I mean, how do you how do you look at that, knowing that you you, you might get the best results from spending 80 percent of the time with your puppy, but an awful lot of people are giving their puppies away or their young dogs away for, you know, however long your obedience classes are, or your advanced classes. It's about the bond. Oh, okay. So as long as that dog is not bonding to another dog in the house, we get dogs in here all the time. And I can tell that dog has spent most of its first six months of its life in a backyard with another dog. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have the interaction with humans. It doesn't want to please a human. It really cares. Not, you're just something holding him back. You're just holding on to his leash and keeping him from being with that other dog that he wants. So we, we think it's more important that they, they learn how to interact with humans mm -hmm. and, and, and please us and, and want to work for us. Yep. That's interesting. That whole, uh, buy two dogs out of the same litter thing. We, we hear that story once in a while. Our, our neighbors did that. They bought two Kiernan Terriers. You know, this was like 10 years ago. They bought a male and a female out of the same breeding. And I actually think they were pet store dogs or something. They were, anyway, they were terrible dogs they didn't get any training they ended up they bit my dog they bit my daughter i mean they just they're gone now mm -hmm. but you could see that there was no you, you weren't reeling those dogs back that you, you like what you're talking about you could just see they were too far gone to work with just about and maybe you know maybe somebody could have done something with them but man <laughs> the owners weren't qualified yeah i mean we we get two litter mates in all the time or two dogs from the same household and yeah, it's, it's, you're never going to have the same relationship that you would if you had started out and separated them early. But there is hope. There is a good chance that with a lot of time and a lot of attention, we can get them. Now, at first, in the first week, you get them out of the kennel and you take them for a walk and you start working them. They're going to be looking over their shoulder going, hey, where's my brother? Where's my sister? Where's my friend? That's all they won't think about. They won't take food from your hand. They won't chase a toy. They won't do anything. All they want to do is be with their other one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it's a pack disruption. Um, some, something just occurred to me. Anybody who's listening to this who might ever, ever consider uh, getting to puppies at the same time, same litter, not the same litter, whatever, do yourself a favor and go find somebody, find a couple who has twin babies <laughs> and babysit <laughs> them for one night. And then tell me in the morning, cause we, you know, we have eight year old twins. Uh, it teaches you real quick that you don't want <laughs> two infants <laughs> of any sort, four legged or two legged. It's a lot of work. And you know, there's a, you know, I, and then obviously it can lead to these de developmental issues that you're talking about with dogs. So it's a, uh, it's a, it's wise words there from you, Rody. Yeah, but I grew up, uh, you know, my best friends were twins, two guys named Jason and James. And I was friends with them all through high school. And there was that bond they had that was inseparable. Yep. And, and you know, I was never close to one or the other more than it was. It was maybe I like to spend a little more time around this guy. But those two, they were always, you know, inseparable. It's incredible. I mean, my daughter's. You know, everybody's going a little stir crazy in the whole pandemic thing, but 
my daughters, I'm, I'm trying to get them to understand, like, you know, the neighbor girl next door, she's by herself. She's the same age as them, but she's by herself. She can't play with anybody. My little girls, I mean, this didn't even like, it, yeah, obviously mm-hmm. it disrupted their lives, but they have their best friend with them all mm-hmm. the time. And it's just an incredible thing. So even, even knowing that, don't get two dogs at the same time, two puppies. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. I, I failed. Yeah, it's it's a tough one. So why retrievers, man? Why, why, why primarily labs? Why, why all retrievers? I, you know, I grew up as a, a hunter of everything. I hunted some birds, I hunted deer. Uh, but you know, when I was in college, I got introduced to a guy that took me goose hunting for the first time. And I, I look back and I think now what I know, the dog was probably terrible, but my memories of it was just, oh my gosh, that dog is incredible. You mean, you mean he sits here beside you and goes and gets your birds and you don't have to do anything? That is awesome. I got to have one of those, you know? And, and what it did was it combined my love of animals and my love of hunting and bam, I mean, it just came together. And I, I've just always been a, a waterfowl hunter. I love the, the work that goes into the, the, the slop and the, the dirt. I mean, you get nasty and you're up to your, up to your chest in water and you're having to call the ducks and you have to work them in. And there's so many things that go into that. And then just being able to sit there, even on a slow morning and be able to love on my dog. I, I, there's, you can't lose. You can't lose when you go out and you do it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a pretty cool thing. Do you, are you doing any uh, upland hunting down there? You know, I, I've done a little bit. We can go up to the panhandle. You know, I can go six, eight hours and, and probably be into some some pheasants, and I've done quite a bit of that. Um, but it's it's just a little inconvenient for my location. Um, primarily in my area, we do a lot of waterfowl hunting, a lot mm-hmm. of dove hunting. So that's what I kind of – that became my niche. That's what I carved out. Yeah, and, it, you know, you so you turned – you just you just had a natural bend toward duck and goose hunting anyway, and you know there isn't a better option out there than a lab or a chessy basically for doing that. And so you're just you just kind of drawn to that. And I was it, when I when I was digging into your uh, your history a little bit, I saw that uh, down at your facility down there in Texas, you have you built a whole bunch of different kinds of ponds to train in, right? We did. Like, we I, did. I want to talk about that because that's. That's not, I, I'm hearing that from trainers more now that they're building custom ponds, flooded timber, different, different styles. But it, I don't, I don't recall hearing that like commonly very long ago. So it's, it feels like something people are like, there's so much value here that I'm, I'm writing the check for that bulldozer. I'm doing whatever I can to get somebody <laughs> in and build it. Can we, let, let's just talk about that a little bit. How, how many do you have? Uh, Gosh, I'd have to count them. We probably have. 10, 10 to 12 different ponds. Uh, what's worked for me, and, and I don't think most people would have the luxury that I have, and that is we have a staff, and I have a trainer named Luke that has been successful. He can train advanced dogs. And in the summertime, when it gets really hot, most of our master hunter dogs go home for a few months. And so the, the our, our top dog level, the load goes down a little bit. And so I'm able to push my dogs over to Luke and I'm able to actually get on the dozer myself, which I really enjoy doing and building exactly what I want. So I spend anywhere from a month to two months every summer adding more water. Mm, It's so cool to think about to just have all those different little training environments to work through and prepare a dog so well. Um, I want to I want to talk. You you mentioned something there, and I, I just randomly ran across this. I don't remember what I was reading, but somebody wrote something the other day that I read that said he he said he felt guilty. Uh, you know, he, he kind of alluded to the fact that he has a high level performing dog, and I don't know if it's a it's a trialer or a hunt test dog or if it's just his hunting dog, but he kind of realized that he wasn't giving it a whole lot of praise because it was so. It was good enough where he expected it to do his job and kind of hadn't really had, you know, had kind of moved away from feeling like you got to give him a lot of love and had started, gone back and started really offering up some like lovey dovey praise and said that dog just changed. Like the the personality came out even better. It kind of seems like what you're talking about when you're running, you know, master hunters and these dogs that are so accomplished. And now you go, I'm going to give them training, but I'm going to give them some, some play involved in there. I mean, is, is there like a psychological benefit to that? It's funny you bring that up, Tony, because I don't think anybody's ever said this or put this out there. But my wife, and I thought she was crazy when she first said it. Have you ever heard of the five love languages? Mm-hmm. Okay, it's 
it's basically that people have a couple of different love languages like uh, gift giving or acts of service or so, so, such and so forth. My wife can elaborate more fully on it, but she believes strongly that dogs have five love languages, just like people. And she believes when we teach our trainers coming up, you know, with a young dog, you need to find that dog's love languages and speak his love language. So if he enjoys physical petting, then make that how you praise him. If he enjoys verbal praise, then make that how you reward him. If he in, if it's a acts of service or it's a retrieve or it's a toy or it's food, find she'll elaborate on the five that she's got picked out and lined out. But basically, I mean, it's it's she's got a good point, and it's exactly what you're saying is you find that dog's language which makes him feel good about himself and want to please you, and you'll get the best out of that dog every time. 